So let's finish chapter five here. And we were talking about the different types. And just for review, let's do that. Let's go through those. So the best one we can possibly have, the best one we can get is a general warranty deed. And this means that the person who is the grantor, the person who is giving it to us, now don't forget that the only one that has to sign these are the grantor, right? The grantee does not have to sign your deed, okay? The grantor is going to give us all of these different uh, covenants. They are going to give us the covenant that they are, um, they own it and have the right to convey it. They are, it doesn't have any encumbrances that we don't know about already. They're not going to come back to us and nobody's going to come back to us on a superior deed to take this property away. Right. The fourth is that we are going to give everybody every document and go to, we'll testify and everything else, further assurance that we will, that um, to make this happen, to make sure that you keep it. And the last one is that we'll pay the cost. We'll pay the cost. Okay. So that is warranty forever. So those five, this is the best one you can get. A general warranty deed is the absolute best deed you can get. All right. And that's what's required in our um, offer to purchase and contract. That is what's in the boilerplate language. So this is the one we want if we can get it. All right. Now, the other one, the next one would be if I only owned it for a limited period of time. Now, a general warranty deed goes back 30 years in North Carolina, okay? So they have to have 30 years. A special warranty deed would be if I only owned it for a short period of time. And I, I'm going to tell you that I own it. And um, for the period of time that I have owned it, it hasn't been encumbered. There's nobody going to take it back or anything else. But I can't tell you what happened before I bought it out of foreclosure. So it's limited to the time that I owned it. Okay, so that's what a special warranty deed is. Okay, now the next one is a bargain and sale deed, and a bargain and sale deed is not in North Carolina. You just have to know what they are. Okay, because you could get a national question on this. And a bargain and sale deed simply is that says I own it, but I'm going to give it to you, but I'm not making any warranties whatsoever. You get it, I own it, it's yours. Whatever happens, happens, okay? So this is um, the same as what we're going to see next is a quick claim deed, which we'll use in North Carolina. The thing is that in this particular case, in a bargain and sale deed, we're going to say that we own it. We're just not going to tell you anything else. So anybody could come and take your, pay, take your, um, take your house away or fight you for um, warranty forever, right? Try to get back in there. Now, a quick claim deed simply says, I'm not even going to tell you if I own it. But if I had any rights to it, I'm giving them up. I'm not going to take any rights to it. Okay. And that's what a quick claim deed is. So if we have a, um, if we, uh, if we, if we're going to do a partition suit, if we have a, a cloud on the title where we want to go find out who, um, who used to own it, maybe we found a signature that was missing, anything like that, we just go do a quick claim deed. Where basically they said, I don't know if I'm not even telling you, I'm not being specific, I'm not warranting that I had any kind of ownership. All I'm saying is that if I did, I'm giving it up. Same thing with the, like in a divorce proceeding or anything else like that, that's what they would use. They would use a quick claim deed, quick claim deed, okay? All right. The next thing is, those are all voluntary, right? You sell a house, you get rid of them. What about involuntary? Involuntary. The first thing we have to talk about, involuntary means somebody's going to take it from you. Okay? Somebody's going to take it from you. So the first thing is a sheet. A sheet means that you died. You didn't have a will. Last will and testament, you had nothing. And you couldn't, they couldn't find any heirs. So this is usually either abandoned properties or folks who die and they have property and don't have anybody to give it to. The state will go to the first cousins, try to find down to the first cousins. If they can't find somebody down to the first cousins, what they're going to do is they're going to take that property. And they are going to give it to, um, they're going to sell it. And in that little tiny writing there, it says the North Carolina State Educational Assistance Authority 
That is who gets the money. So it's not like the state puts it in the general fund or anything else like that. But what they do is they give it to this educational assistance authority. who goes back into the schools. Okay? goes back into the schools. That's where that money goes. All right? So the state's not putting it in their pocket. Now, the next one is the eminent domain. Eminent domain. And eminent domain is the right okay, of the government to take private land for the public good. They have the right. Eminent domain is the law, okay? If they want the land, they are going to have to condemn it, condemn, the pro and that's the process. So they go to court and they say, we're going to take this land because we want to put another road in. We want to widen the road from two lanes to five lanes, okay? We got to take the land, the property on both sides. <clears throat> okay, so we're going to use the process of condemnation. We're going to go out and condemn that land. All right, we're going to take it for the public good. It can't be for private benefit. It has to be for public good. And they have to pay you just what's called just compensation. So they're going to have an appraiser figure out how much that's going to cost. They're going to figure out, you know, they're going to give you some type of money. Okay. Now, if they take a piece of property that's leased, maybe there's a house that had a renter in it, that terminates the lease. The lease is over. It's very, very difficult to terminate a lease if somebody's in there. Even if we're purchasing a property that's got a, a, a tenant in there, we can't just evict them. But in eminent domain, the lease terminates. We're taking the land. Okay. So that might be a um, an estate by will. If you, because you know, it doesn't just happen overnight. They don't just come tomorrow and say, we're taking your land on Friday and um, that'll be the end of it. Okay. They don't just do that. It goes, takes a little while. So remember that the right of the government to take the land is eminent domain. The process is called condemnation and they have to give you just compensation. Now, what if I don't think just compensation is enough? I can go to court and fight it, okay? And I can sue for it, but I can also now, I can take the money that they gave me and then sue for more, okay? But again, it's gonna be up to the judge. You're gonna to have to go in front of the judge, right? And get that, all right? So the owner can sue, uh, just an example, more than the percentage of their land that was actually ta uh, taken. Maybe it more was taken and they didn't pay enough, right? So you're going to have to take them to court. All right. Eminent domain is the law. Condemnation is the process. And they have to pay you just compensation. I'll let you define just compensation. All right. Whatever they decide the land is worth is what they're going to be. Now, also talking about involuntary alienation, taking it away from you. Specific lien foreclosures. If you didn't pay your mortgage, if you didn't pay your real estate taxes, um, either one of those, if you had special assessments, your HOA dues, those are all specific. Can you can they foreclose on your property if you don't pay for those things? They can take it away from you, right? They can take it away from you. You have to do that. And right? you have to make sure those are paid for. Now, Let's say somebody has been living, let's say you have 500 acres on the Roanoke River. You have this nice piece of property. And on the river, you put this nice little fishing house out there on the riverbank. It's got a kitchen. It's got a, a, a bedroom in case I want to just sleep out there, spend the night there. It's got a bathroom. It's heated. It's nice. But it's way on the back of my 500 acres. And what if I move to Colorado and I don't come back there? Well, if somebody moved in there and they lived there for 20 years, openly, continuously, right, um, exclusively, adversely, and notoriously, all right, so open is known to others, continuous is not on again or off again, it has to be continuous, all right? <clears throat> Exclusive means that they're not sharing it with five other groups, they're just them living there. All right. Adverse means that I didn't put them there. 
I want my land back. And then notorious is they, they're there without permission, my permission, all right? So that's the five covenants of adverse possession. This is your squatter's rights. This is your squatter's rights. But they would have to live there for 20 years under these same conditions. And nobody said anything to them that they didn't own that property. And then they can go to court and say, I want the property. I've lived here for 20 years. I want, I want the property. I want it to be in my name now. Okay. Now, 20 years if that happens. But let's go back to, last, to Tuesday night's class. What if we got the property? What if we got the property? Remember Amon bought my property last time? Last week? He bought the property, right? And he held the property for seven years. And let's say that Callie, after seven and a half years, eight years, comes knocking on Amon's front door and says, hey, look, I hate to break the news to you, but my family's owned this house for the last, for 50 years now. It was never sold. I don't know how Sam got it, and I don't know how he transferred it to you, but we can, we want our house back. Poor mom. He said, I just went through this with Sam. He tried to sell it out for me, but I, no, I won that case, but no, I'm here now. I have this deed. And if Amon has lived there with seven, for seven years and he thought he has a legitimate ownership to it, that is the color of title. That means that he thought that he bought it, everything was right, the lawyer did, the, uh, did everything correctly, did the title work and everything else. Amon lived there for eight years until Callie came back and knocked on our door. Well, Amon can say, uh-uh, I'm not moving. Let's go to court. I've had color of title here for seven years now. I'm going to claim adverse possession, okay? I'm going to claim that. I'm going to say, I have it. I had it. I paid for it. I did everything else correctly, and nobody said a word for the last eight years. So it's seven years with the color of title. So if we think we're in there legitimately, and we're there for seven years, we can claim adverse possession, All right? Nobody's going to take it away from you without going to court, okay? So you have to have lived there for seven years, all right? So 20 years, if I am just freeloading in that fishing shack for 20 years, but if I thought I bought it legitimately and I have a title and I have a deed to it um, and to find out that the deed's fraudulent, I've had to have it seven years. After seven years, I can lay claim to it. Go to the court and have them issue it to me, okay? We're not going to let him on lose that house again. He likes that house. Nice house. Right? So that's why. So he's been there seven years. Okay? And then Callie would go to church, go, have to go to um, court. And the judge is going to say, you know, you had all of this time to come back and say something and you didn't. Right? And you didn't say anything. So we are going to, um, we're going to let him stay. He's had it for longer than seven years as the statute of limitation. In this particular case, he's got color of title. It's called color of title. But he had ownership, legitimate ownership. Okay. Adverse possession. We have to go to court. It doesn't just happen automatically. We're going to have to go to court, all right, to seek that. So a suit to, um, for action or quiet title. That's really what that's all about. Now, if we see that also what could happen for, as a suit to, or action to quiet title what we could do also is have our attorney, let's say there's some gaps in the, in the title history over time. The attorney can go and try to quiet that by having this suit also. Make a public, uh, public announcement, says, hey, look, anybody who lays claim to 123 Main Street, please show up on January 15th at three o'clock at the third floor courthouse, Carteret County, and make your claim. Otherwise, forever hold your peace. If nobody shows up, you're going to get a default judgment, all right? And it's going to get closed out that way. So that is a suit to quiet title or an action to quiet title either way, all right? How do we transfer this property legitimately? Now, if I don't have a will, 
if I don't have a will, my family or my heirs are going to get my property if I die by intestate succession. I don't have to have a will. They're going to, but I don't really want to leave it up to the state to decide who should get my property, right? That's why you write a will so that it's directed. But if not, the state is going to decide who your next of kin is. It's going to be your spouse if she's still alive or he's still alive. Is it going to be your, um, is it going to be your kids, right? Which one? Is it going to be divided in thirds? So if you want to make your intentions known, you have to write a will, all right, which is the second one here, and that is a device, right? But if you don't and you die, they're going to look for your next of kin, which would be intestate succession, intestate. Okay? To be testate is to have a will. To be intestate is not to have a will. Mm -hmm. And if to transfer it by will, the will is a device to do so. So by descent, when the owner dies and no will, that's intestate. State laws regarding intestate succession will rule um, by will. All right. Now, keep in mind this is very important. Even if you have a will, if you have survivorship in your ownership, what supersedes? What's more important, the will or survivorship? Survivorship, right? Survivorship override. You can't will somebody out if you already got joint tenancy with rights of survivorship or you have tenancy by the entirety. You can't rule somebody out, even with a will. Can't do it. You can do it for tenants in common. You can do it with um, uh, ownership and severalty. Obviously, there's nobody else. But you can if you have survivorship, all right? So uh, cannot override survivorship. All right, and we talked about devices. Okay. All right, let's talk about public records. I think I showed you a whole bunch of public records Tuesday night, did I not? Pretty much everything about Mrs. Hassel's house that she owns, right, in Wake County. Anything you want to know about it. It's all public records, right? So we record things, we give notice, we, what has priorities, right? What happens if they're unrecorded documents? And then the chain of title, chain of title. So again, very important, recording. This is what your attorney is going to do when you close on the house. The settlement is gonna be when buyer and seller get together, sign all the documents, buyer's gonna hand over the money, Everything's going to go through the attorney. You are still not closed. Two parts. Settlement is one. The closing is when the deed is recorded, the mortgage satisfaction is recorded, the new mortgage is recorded. We make sure that the title search is completed, and then the funds are distributed. Distributed. Okay? That's what happens at the closing. That is after we settle everything. All right? It's two parts. Two parts. All right. So the recording gives legal priority the interest recorded first. Remember what I said, right? If we don't record our deed, somebody can come in and say, I got the deed. That's my house. I want it back. I want them out. Right? So first in time, first in right, whoever's in there first. Okay. North Carolina was what they call a pure race state. First one in. First one is right. Okay. First serve. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, recording this deed, and by recording, what we're doing is we are giving notice. We're giving notice to everybody, all right? So constructive notice means that we have told everybody, because it's public record now, that Sam's the owner, okay? Now, if I don't, if I decide not to record that deed, just by moving into that house, I give an actual notice. I've given actual notice, and they're a little different. Okay. So constructive notice lets the world know it's public knowledge that I own that property now. Actual notice means that all I did was take possession of it. The buyer and seller know, right? We sat across the table from each other. Seller collected the money, buyer paid the money. We all closed, we all signed the docs. 
That's actual notice. Then I moved in. Obviously, once I moved in, the neighbor saw me move in. I'm the new neighbor. Right? I'm the new neighbor. Okay, so when we talk about priority of records, again, first one in, right? First one in. Refers to the order of when documents or liens were recorded. Who's got priority? Um, mechanics liens, who's got priority? First one who recorded that has a mechanics lien, he's gonna get paid first, right? If you gotta record within 120 days, gotta put that lien on there. Gotta to come to court within 180. Mm -hmm. Now, income tax liens and special assessments not typically recorded until they're past due. So you gotta have, remember we talked about taxes and what happens on January 1? Your property gets a lien on it, right? It's not a recorded lien yet. Not a recorded lien. What's going to happen January 6th of the next year? Now they're going to record that you're late. Now, if you go and make try to sell that house, you're going to have to pay them. And they're only going to give you a certain amount of time before they sell it for you so that they can get paid. Okay. Same thing with special assessments. Remember one and one A, right? All right. So they're not usually recorded until they are past due. Once they are past due, though, they become a public record. <clears throat> now, we've been talking about this for the last 15 or 20 minutes now, but we've also been talking about it before. It's a chain of title, which means that every single owner and transfer from one person to the next, A to B, B to C, C to D, so on, right? Has to be linked together. This is the chain of title. Make sure there's no gaps in there, all right? And you has to be at least 30 years backwards in North Carolina, 30 years on that chain of title, all right? 30 years. Now, just because you have good title, does it mean that you have marketable title? Just because you have good title, does it mean you have marketable title? Not really. You can, have, you can be the owner of a piece of property and have good title, legitimate title, but you could be so encumbered, right? You can have liens on it. You can have uh, uh, encroachments on it. You can have easements on it that you can't transfer the property, right? You might have a personal property um, tax lien on it. You could have a mortgage that's more than your sale price of your house. Very possible. Um, any of those things. Maybe you have. Um, uh, maybe you have a judgment against you or mechanics liens that add up to more than what you can sell the house for. Can you transfer that law? Can you market that title? What happens if I wanna buy that house that's, so, that's got more um, liens on it than, um, than what the seller can pay? What's gonna happen? What do you think? Yeah, you're gonna buy it. Absolutely right. I get it. Now, unless I really want that piece of property, I'm not paying their liens, right? I'm not paying their liens. Now, maybe if they have a mechanics lien from two weeks before that put on a new bedroom and I'll say, all right, I'll pay for it. That might be something that would be, you know, that would be considered, but I'm not paying any kind of past taxes and I'm not going to pay any kind of mortgage liens on it, right? Everything is circumstantial, but if you buy it and it's got liens on it, you bought the property, particularly specific liens. They're yours. That's not good, right? So it can be, you can have good title, but you might not have marketable title. You might not be able to sell it. And what's the value of a uh, property that can't be transferred? How much is a property that can't be transferred worth? Nothing, right? It's not worth anything. Can't sell it. There's no value, right? No value on the market. All right, so five criteria for a marketable title. The first one, it has to be free from significant liens and encumbrances. 
right? You gotta be for you gotta get rid of those. There has to be no serious defect. It can't be falling into a sinkhole, right? We don't want that. Okay. Um, no questions of law or fact that question its validity. Are you the real owner? How did you get this? Let me see the deed. You can't claim lost deed. I want to see how you got it, right? Um, number four, you have to have the promise of quiet enjoyment to the grantee. I have to, if I'm buying it, I don't want anybody coming back and harassing me, right, about this house, particularly the person who's selling it or any money that he owes to Guido and his friends because he took out loans. Don't come to me. I don't want that, right? And it has to be reasonably assured of fair market value, right? Now, in a distressed sale, you might see some stuff, but if it's an arm's length transaction, you and I shaking hands over a deal, we have to be close to fair market value, okay? Fair market value if we're going to get marketable title. We're going to do that. Attorney's going to do that title search. And he's going to go back and he's going to create an abstract, an abstract of everybody who owned it and every document that was made to transfer that property to the next purchaser. And then take the next purchaser and make an abstract of every document that was made to go to the next purchaser. And he's going to go back and do that for the last 30 years. So it's not just like a chain of title where it was name, um, deed, next buyer, name, deed, next buyer, name. But this abstract has got all of it in there, all of the documents, everything else. So this is that written history of all the title conveyances. All right. There's a lot here. There's a lot here. And that's what they got to go back through. And that's what you're paying when you're doing a title search. Now, the Marketable Title Act says that any claim greater than 30 years, which we've been talking about, any claim greater than 30 years is extinguished. You have no more claim. You got to do it within 30 years. That's the Marketable Title Act. Okay. Marketable Title Act. Now, you're going to buy title insurance. If you have a loan, your lender is going to want, it's going to require title insurance, at least for their part. And then you can buy optional owner's insurance. And what this is going to do is going to protect you in the event that something from the past comes back and affects your title. Okay. You'll have this insurance. Um, so it is going to be required. It's just an insurance policy for the past that makes sure that the title agent didn't miss something, an owner that probably could have made a claim on it or anything else could have been your. Um, could have been there. Now, we talked about this the other day, but you got to remember this. Let's say we are encroached. We are five, five feet over the line and we didn't get a survey. Your If you have to come back and move that fence, your title insurance will not cover you. Okay. Anything that would have been found in a search, I mean, in a survey, will not, and you didn't have a survey, will not be covered under your title insurance. It won't. So you need to have that survey done. Okay. You need to have that survey done. Ready? So both the lenders and borrowers may have title insurance. The lender's policy expires once the mortgage loan is paid in full. It's a one-time premium, right? So maybe mine is, let's say I paid 100,000, mine's worth 20,000, the mortgage company's worth 80,000. Every time I make a payment, my, my value of my policy goes up, the banks goes down a little bit because I'm paying off principal, right? So I have more ownership. So I don't have to change what I paid to the end. What happens at the end is if I pay off that mortgage, then I have 100% coverage on my title policy, right? So it just moves every time we make a payment. But it's only a one-time payment. One-time payment. So really, it says protects the purchaser and or the lender against loss due to an existing covered title defect that was undiscovered when the policy became effective. Missing errors, missing signatures on deeds, forced um, sale of a property, anything else like that, okay? That's what title insurance will help you do, okay? Liens that were missed 20 years ago, you don't want to have to pay that, right? That's not your problem. 
Okay. The North Carolina Connor Act. You may want to remember the Connor Act. All right, the North Carolina Connor Act. And what this says is that most real estate documents to be recorded to be enforceable. That is why, first of all, the statute of frauds has, says we have to have it in writing. The Connor Act says we have to record it in order for these things to be enforceable against other parties. All right. That's why they, we don't close until the, um, the attorney goes and records these documents under the Connor Act in North Carolina. OK, so it's not required as a valid con uh, uh, as a valid deed, but to be enforceable against other parties, they're going to have to record it. All right. Under the Con Connor Act. All right. So that is what makes these things enforceable. So. Any kind of liens on your properties are going to be recorded. Any kind of mortgages, any kinds of um, encumbrances or, or more encroachments, your de any kind of liens, any kind of deeds are all going to be recorded so that people know it's a public record. It's out there. And it's all because of the Connor Act. OK. And everything has to be in writing, be enforceable. Right? Verbal agreements are worth nothing. They're worth nothing. And even though, you know, one of us says, I'm going to do this and I don't do it, and you're going to be mad about it, you've got no leg to stand on. It has to be in writing in order for it to be enforced. All right. Now, we talked about this just a few minutes ago. Settlement, there's a difference between settlement and closing. The difference between the settlement and the closing, the settlement is when we are going to meet with the attorney, we're going to sign the docs, we're going to do all that other stuff. And then the closing is the date and time the deed is recorded. The attorney is not allowed to give out any funds either to the seller or to the uh, uh, any commission to the agents, to the brokers, until this is recorded. Not allowed to disperse any funds. That's why it gets done. Okay? That's why it gets done. The North Carolina excise tax. Excise tax. All right. So this is going to be paid by the sellers. Unless, obviously, we say that the in the contract somewhere it says the buyer is going to pay it. But with that being said, this is a seller's expense. OK. And we can call it the deed stamps and we can call it transfer tax and we can call whatever revenue stamps they have here. But it is the excise tax. And what this excise tax is is the state is going to charge you $1 for every $500 worth of sales price or any part thereof. So if I pay if I sell my house for $500, I have to pay $1 in excise tax. If I sell my house for $502, I have to pay $2 in excise tax because I have a part of another 500 that $2. Okay. So what we're going to look at is we're going to take, and this is calculated, always calculated on the full purchase price. And it's always a whole dollar amount. It is never a partial dollar. So we're always going to round up. Okay. We're always going to round up. Huh? So let's say we have a sales price, $249,750. We're going to divide that by 500 because it's $1 per 500 and any part thereof. And that's going to come to $499,50. Now, listen to me. There is never a decimal point in the excise tax. Never a decimal point in the excise tax. We always round up. We always round up, okay? So if I sell my house, if I sell my house for $650,000, I'm gonna divide this by 500, right? And it's gonna cost me what, $1,300? Anybody disagree with that? Put it in your calculator. Now, if I sell this for 650 
490. Now I got a decimal in that answer, right? It's 1300 point whatever. I'm gonna round it up, okay? We're gonna round it up one more dollar, so it'll be 1301. But what happens if I get 651.505? It's gonna be what? It's gonna be 1302, right? Because it's every 500, $1 for every 500, and then any part extra. So if I divide 500 into 651.505, I'm going to get 1301 and one tenth, right? Or one one hundredth, 0.01. Doesn't matter. I'm going to round it up one dollar. Okay. Does not matter. I'm going to round it up one dollar. Let's jump to the math packet real quick and let's do your math homework. It'll make it easy. You should be able to do these problems in like virtually no time whatsoever. On the top of your math packet, Again, on page nine, sales price divided by 500 is how much the excise tax is rounded to the, shouldn't be rounded up, it should be rounded up to the nearest whole dollar, not rounded down, never round down. All right, never round down. So if the seller owes the $133.01 in excise tax, it'll be rounded up to 135, $134. All right, question number one. What would the excise tax be on $125,000? Go ahead, pull out your calculators. You can do this. There you go, right? We're going to divide that $125,000 by $500, and that's going to give me $250. Okay? What about $385,000? Three hundred eighty-five thousand divided by seven uh, divided by five hundred is going to give me seven seventy, right? That's going to be the excise tax. Now, what's going to be the excise tax on two thirty-nine nine? Two thirty-nine nine. Yep, we're going to round it up, right? So 479.80, we're going to round it up to 480. Okay. What about the excise tax on 750, 435? There you go. Again, round it up, right? Round it up. It's not a, it's not a partial, so it should be 1501. 1501. Ah, oh, question. An excise tax is always charged to the seller. On this closing statement, it will show as a what? What's it on the closing statement? Seller debit. Yes, seller debit. He's going to pay it, right? Um, the, the buyer's not going to get credit for that. That's going to go to the North Carolina, the local taxation authority. Um, so the buyer's not going to get that. That'll be the seller debit. The, the attorney will get the credit and the attorney's going to pay it off. Okay. So it'll only be a seller debit. All right. Okay, let's do these last six real quick and then we can leave out the math homework. I think that's all there are in that one because I'm not saying. All right, so number one, sales price of $167,000. How much? Yeah, there you go. 167 divided by 500 is $334. What about 299.9? Yep, if I divide that by 500, I'm going to get 599.80. I'm going to round up to 600. What about uh, 307.599? If I do this, I'll, if I divide this up, it'll be 615.19. Round it up to 616. There you go. Um, sales price of 345.5. $345.5. 
345.5 divided by 500. I got more than that. I got 691. There you go. All right, do this one. Number five. Now we got, if we do 219,450, if I divide that by 500, there you go. So going to be 438.90, and we're going to round it up. Um, number six, a home sells for 86,597. There's a $50,000 loan assumption. What is the value of the excise tax printed on the deed? Now, keep in mind this, because this might be the kind of question you see. The excise tax is always paid on the full amount, right? Always paid on the full amount. So regardless of the loan assumption, the sale price is 186,597. So if we divide that up, 500, right? And that's going to be 173.19, right? 173.19, and we're going to round it up to 174. So we got, um, in this particular case, it'll be 86.597, right? Divided by 500, and that's going to be 173.19, and, and we're going to round it up to 174. Yeah, disregard any loan assumptions. It's always on the, on the full purchase price. All right. All right, there you go. Uh, loan assumption is included in the full sales price. Yeah, that's that's just going to be included. You're going to end up with a credit for the loan and the sales price. And we'll see that when we do the closing statements later on. Okay, so yes, it is included. Okay, so let's do a few of these questions so that we can move on to the next chapter. All right. Essential elements of a valid deed include all of the following, except, right, except acknowledgement, it's got to be in writing, competent grantor, execution by the grantor, all right? Yeah, right? We are looking at what? There doesn't have to be acknowledged to make it valid. It'll be acknowledged when it's recorded to make it enforceable, right, when it's enforceable. So we talked about all these most recently, right? Possession, cloud on the titles. We talked about adverse possession. Conoract is about recording. General warranty deed is the best one. The grantor is the person selling it and the grantee is the person receiving it. All right, true or false? There's only a couple of these. Uh, to be valid and enforceable, a deed must be recorded. Okay, true, however, it can be valid without being recorded, right? It's valid, it's still good. It's just a matter of it's not recorded and it's not protected. Uh, second question, this type of deed implies the grantor has ownership, but does not warrant anything about the property. Which one is that? There you go. Bargain and sale, yeah, right? I said I own some of it, but I'm not giving you any kind of warranties. Right now, a quick claim deed would say that I don't even I'm not even going to tell you I own it. But if I did, I'm giving it up. All right. Bargain and sale deed. Bobby Beyer recently purchased a home for two hundred and sixty thousand from Susanna. In the process, he obtained a conventional loan from BB&T for two hundred thousand dollars. How much was the excise taxes paid at closing and who paid it? Yeah. Okay. So we go by the purchase price. All right. Not by the amount borrowed in this case. It's the purchase price. So Susanna, the seller, paid five hundred and twenty dollars. Okay. True or false? A deed would be considered a uh, considered valid if signed by an authorized attorney, in fact, rather than by the seller. Yeah, what if I was incompetent? What if the, the state had said that um, I'm not capable of taking care of myself and they put a guardian in there? They would be my attorney in fact, right? So it's true. I'm acting as somebody else or somebody else is acting as me, 
As long as they have legal documentation that says that, then they can do that. Okay. True or false, a person signs a deed conveying property to their best friend. They place the deed in a safe deposit box and do not tell anyone of the transfer. Upon this person's death, the best friend receives ownership of the property. True or false? Yeah, right? It has to be delivered in the grantor's lifetime and accepted in the grantee's lifetime, right? At this point, that property belongs to the heirs of the grantor. That's where that's going, okay? So it is false. It has to be delivered during the lifetime of the grantor. All right? All right. Deed recordation is necessary to protect the title against A, the seller, B, other prospective buyers, or all of these. Yeah, definitely all of these. Definitely all of these. All right? Anyone that could have a potentially claim against the property. If you like this video, feel free to share it with a friend. For more real estate education content, please subscribe to the channel. From all of us at Seacoast Real Estate Academy, thank you for watching.